Hello, I'm Grant Bartley. You're listening to the Philosophy Now radio show. And in a slight cha- change from the advertised program, tonight we'll be talking about mind, science and metaphysics. I'll be interviewing Professor David Papanu, who's the Professor of the Philosophy of Natural Science at King's College London. He has a research interest in both the philosophy of science and the philosophy of mind, and we'll know about be touching on both those areas. Rosanella and Alan will be providing live music. OK, so let's start with... Uh, uh, David, uh, can you tell me what your philosophical interests are, please, and how you got into them a little bit, please? How I got into them? Uh, I have a lot of philosophical interests. Uh-huh. Uh, I uh, work, I guess, mainly on philosophy of mind and philosophy of science. OK, also... what do those areas involve for the people who don't know anything about philosophy? Philosophy of mind. Well, I've got, I've got a lot more interests. I mean, okay. I, I, I work in philosophy of biology, sure. philosophy of psychology, uh-huh. philosophy of maths, mm-hmm. and and I first got into philosophy because I was a maths student for right. for four years, and I kind of got interested in logic and philosophy of maths, and that's how okay. it started off. And then I did philosophy of science. Uh, Sure. Philosophy of natural science is a story which goes with why I'm called the professor of philosophy of natural science. Okay. You might come back to. Sure. And then I guess my interests broadened out. So I, I mostly work now in the area of philosophy of mind, uh, psychology, and its overlap with science. So, so what I'm interested in is trying to understand, in very general terms, how the mind works in the light of scientific findings about human beings in the brain uh, and uh, and also I think generally about what science tells us about the nature of reality and ourselves Okay, what sort of particularly philosophical questions would you ask uh, about the mind and, and science? Well, the obvious Would one ask? So, I'm I'm persuaded of materialism and we could uh, mm-hmm. come back and talk about exactly what that involves sure, and what I'm sure that we will that means, but uh, I think that the the world we live in and ourselves is basically a material world, we're material beings, Mm -hmm. and part of the philosophical challenge that raises is to understand how all the things we're familiar with, like consciousness, thought, uh, feelings, meaning, free will, fit in Uh to a material world. I mean, at first past you might think that if if there's just a material world if there's just matter well that means there isn't any consciousness or meaning and uh-huh. so on but i think that's the wrong response i think we can see how those things are present even in a material world okay well i i've got a diametrically opposed view to that so i think we let's well, perhaps i'll be able to persuade you of the area of your ways uh, well maybe i i think find it highly unlikely but never mind but i sh- surely we're here to try and get at the truth and what sure. we want to look at is the the arguments i mean i don't think there's much point in just uh, kind of having a little bit of biography where you ask me no. what, what i think i mean i think you we ought to try and figure out what's the right thing to think okay so let's go get into this philosophy philosophy of mind thing mm-hmm. you're you you are a materialist you've just described that as saying the, mm-hmm. the world is a material world therefore mm-hmm. consciousness must be must be material mm-hmm. uh to me it seems to me that the properties of experience such as um emotions and feelings and and meaning Mm -hmm. uh, are not at all the properties of material things so why do you think that the mind is a material thing okay so i think there's very strong pretty overwhelming arguments for thinking that the mind is a material thing and i'll I'll talk about that in a second Mm -hmm. but i recognize that on the other side the the points you just made are also very strong. It's sure. very, very hard to understand how the mind could be material. Surely the the facts of consciousness, the way consciousness appears to us, shows us that consciousness is not material. Mm-hmm. But I think, in ways I'll explain in a second, that if you, if you stick with that assumption, yeah. that somehow consciousness reveals itself to us as non-material, then you get into a pretty absurd philosophical position. And that's why I think we have to question those strong feelings that you have. Uh, Okay, could you flesh that out a bit more, please? Well, well, let's let's start with the argument for being a materialist. So, 
here's how it, how it goes. It's a very simple argument, and sure. uh, I suppose nobody's going to write down notes like it's a lecture, but I think it's simple enough that it's worth, it's worth going through it. Uh-huh. So, okay, his argument uh, that uh, uh, surely want to, we want to suppose that, that our thoughts and feelings and so on have effects in the physical world. In particular, mm-hmm. they affect how we behave, how our bodies move, and how yeah. the physical world is affected as but a the result. The power of, of choice, let's say, or the power of will. Yeah, but don't don't focus on that. But just focus on. The, I mean, uh, we can worry about free will later. Just focus on the fact. That, you know, when I'm thirsty, that's a feeling, right. and it makes me go to the fridge and open it, and that's okay. a physical event. So, you know, mental mental states have physical effects. Okay. And in particular, they make me move my arm to open the fridge and so on. Right. Right. Okay, now think about this physical effect, my, my, arm, my arm moving. Uh, so imagine you're a scientist and you're trying to explain why did my arm move, right? Mm-hmm. And so the scientist will say, well, that's because, you know, the, 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 the muscles contracted and uh, it's because the fibres contracted and that's because sure. electrochemical messages came down your nerves and that's because certain things happened in your motor cortex and that's because certain things happened in your prefrontal cortex and if you were looking at what happened from a scientific point mm-hmm. of view you'd expect to be able to trace back the physical effects your arm moving and so on in terms of physical causes all the way along Certainly. so so now we have a funny situation we have a situation where the first assumption is that your thirst your your feelings cause your arm to move and right. the second assumption is that certain physical processes in your brain cause your arm to move. And it doesn't look right to say that there's two different causes here. I mean, it's not like the guy who's shot and struck by lightning at the same time. There's two independent causes, either of which would have been enough. You don't want to say, look, even if I hadn't been thirsty, I would still have gone to the fridge because my brain would have made me. That's the wrong way to think. Yeah, sure. So so, so, let me just finish. Uh Okay. So look, here's the argument. So, so... There's a mental cause for my arm moving. There's a physical cause for my arm moving. They aren't two different causes. They must just be the same cause. Your feeling must be just one and the same as the brain processes. Well, no, 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 I'm going to take exception to that because the use of the word just is, a, is first of all, you're covering over something there. And, and second of all, I would say, for instance, that, um, OK, you've got all the physical causes of what your brain happens in your brain that goes down your nerves to make your arm move but that doesn't preclude the fact that it was because i felt thirsty that i i had an act of will which um changed the way that okay. my brain worked for instance no, th- th- that's that's a perfectly right coherent position so you're questioning now my assumption uh-huh that this chain of causes, I start with my arm, I go back up the, the, the muscles, the, the nerves to my motor cortex, my prefrontal cortex. You're supposing that at some point as we go back there, we will find a gap somewhere <laughs> where bits of the brain are moving in a way that's not explainable in terms of prior physical circumstances according to the laws of physics. Well, no, now, I, now, I, I, ju- no, I no, just... No, hang on, let, let me just okay. finish. That's a coherent view. That's what right. Descartes thought. Right. That's what interactive dualists thought. It's considered nowadays uh, pretty cranky. I mean, if you were right... Well, no, 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 as you say, we're into discovering the truth, not into discovering what everybody thinks is true or otherwise. No, I agree entirely, but but I just want to point out the consequence of your view. If you were right, right, the physicists ought to be studying what goes on in people's brains in order to discover there's an extra force that arises only in people's brains, which is separate from the electromagnetic force or gravitational no, force. I, I no, like I, mean, I don't like the language you're using because it presupposes the argument. I would say I make choices with my mind. My mind is capable of altering my brain behaviour through right. the choices. I'm just pointing out that this runs um, in the face right. of 200 years of scientific evidence. No, there's it, nothing, your no, interpretation of no, it... Sorry, you, I, it's not my interpretation. I, I can give you the history. Uh-huh. Your view was absolutely standard until about 150 years ago. Uh, there was a small group of scientists in Germany who started thinking that there was no reason to suppose that there are any forces found inside the brain that aren't also found outside the brain. That, that yeah. everything that goes on inside the brain can ex- be explained in terms of forces and physical processes that are also found outside the brain. Well, they that's, remained, that's that, that, a that, presumption, that, though. No, of course that was a presumption. That remained a very much a minority view uh-huh. for at least 100 years. Sure. And, and when I first started doing philosophy, 
there were many philosophers and scientists still then who thought that John Eccles, Sir Karl Popper, mm -hmm. they thought that in the brain there were special forces unknown to current physics that made a difference in the brain. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, I, I'm not trying to argue here from sure. sociology authority. I'm just pointing out that nobody really believes that anymore, and there's a reason. The reason uh -huh. is that the scientists have discovered more and more and more about what goes on inside cells. Right. And there's not the slightest bit of evidence that there are these extra forces. No, but I no, would, Please, I would, let, me, let me just make the, the last... And the crucial, the crucial discovery was, was uh, uh, Hodge, Huxley and Hodgkin in the 50s. Right. They analysed action potential in cells. They explained it in electrochemical terms. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you might notice that nearly all scientists, nearly all philosophers, switched to a materialist view of the mind because mm -hmm. they thought that if the mind, the conscious mind, was separate from the brain, as you think, if, 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 if we go with the no, idea... I don't think it's no, separate. No, 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 I think it's a different just, type of thing. No, let, me just, let me just finish my sentence. I think they are sentence. connected. Right, let me just finish Sorry. my sentence, because I, mean, I, I was just about to get to the point right. I was trying to make, which is, if you think, as you did, that somehow it's obvious that this conscious mind is separate from the brain, then you're condemned to the view that there's, a, there's a, a conscious realm that makes no difference to the physical world. You're condemned to epiphenomenalism. No. You're, you're condemned to the view that we're suffering an illusion that, like a little kid who's in the car and has got a little steering wheel and uh, sitting next, sure. to, next to his mother and she's actually driving and he thinks he's driving, that's what your view will force you to. You, you'll be forced to think that the conscious mind is it appears as if it's controlling the body, but it's not really. OK, I'll just reply to that. that n yeah. Nothing mm. what you attribute to my views is, is anything that I think. First of all, like, epiphenomenalism for the listeners is the view that the, the brain uh, produces the mind from its activity, but the mind has no um, input back into the brain. So there is no actual power of choice or power of will by, by which your mind affects the physical world uh, and I don't believe that I, I believe that the power of choice does affect your brain I think that is entirely explainable through quantum mechanics and I don't think that the mind I think the mind is a different thing from the brain but I don't think it's separate from the brain I think they're connected I think the brain creates the mind I, 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 are we here to to hear your views about the philosophy of mind. No, I don't, I, you, I, you I, I, attributed I, to me views that I don't hold, so I just want to defend myself. I, okay? I'll, I'll just explain uh -huh. what, what the issue is. Uh -huh. uh, there's the view that the mind is separate from the brain. Right. There's the view that the mind affects the body. Mm -hmm. And there's the facts of modern physics. Right. And you've got to give up one of them. No, and, I, and, I and, and, it's and, and, and so, so all, all I'm saying is that if you want, to, it, unless you want to become an epiphenomenalist, which, 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 which you say you don't, well, then you've got a choice. Either you deny modern physics. No, I don't or, do that. Or you give up your idea that the mind is separate from the brain. <laughs> no, I don't do that either. Oh, well, then, then you're. Then I, you're I, think, I think the mind can affect the brain through quantum mechanics because of the observer phenomenon. In, in other words, the observer phenomenon can be. Can be um, used to explain the power of will in the choice of brain states. Well, perhaps, we, perhaps we better talk about quantum mechanics, because I think when we, okay. look at it, when we look at it properly, we, we will see that it doesn't give any room all for right, an we'll independent mind to make a difference to the physical world. All right, we'll talk about quantum mechanics in a minute. First of all, we're going to have um, a song uh, um, by Ro Rosanella and Alan Stewart. The first song is going to be called Harry Went to Heaven. In a four-wheel drive. In a four-wheel drive, okay. And that's what's Not just have. anyway. You know. All right. And that's Alan's song. He actually wrote that. Okay.
Hoping out all over the place Tank or boom, now hurry, he's in space Harry went to heaven in a four-wheel drive Doing a hundred and twenty as he hit the eye Harry little world went one, two, three yep. the, the chief did a loop as he hit the tree Harry's mama say he had no reason To drive like a crazy in a freezing season Harry like to motor like a boy on a mission Now the numbers is up, pays down with the fishes Harry went to heaven in a four-wheel drive Doing a hundred and twenty as he hit the ice Harry's little world went one, two, three yeah. The chief did a loop as he hit the chief For a girl out the daily Renaissance babe with a fine body jelly Harry's little babe was the dish of the day Now Harry is in heaven and he's got to stay away Harry went to heaven in a four-wheel drive Thank you, Rose and Ella, Alan. That was how Harry went to heaven. And um, Alan's new EP, A Call from Drake, is available from iTunes. Yeah, new EP. All right, and uh, <laughs> you can find them on alanstewartmusic.com, rosenellamusic.com, and I'll give that address at the end of the show. Again, I'm Grant Bartley from Philosophy Now magazine. You're listening to the Philosophy Now radio show. We're talking about uh, mind and metaphysics and science with uh, Professor David Papineau, who's the Professor of the Philosophy of Natural Science at King's College London. Um, before the song, um, David, uh, you mentioned quantum mechanics in relation to the, to the mind. Why do you think um, quantum mechanics impinges on the mind-brain debate? I don't think it does, does really. Okay. Uh, but... but it was you who suggested sure. that, that it made a difference. And let me explain why I don't think it does, really. So there's this argument as to why it's, it's difficult to take seriously an independent mind, uh, the difficulty being that it's hard to see how it could make difference in the physical world. It might, you might have thought that argument was presupposing mm -hmm. some kind of physical determinism. I said, you know, think about how my arm moves, you yeah. can trace it back, and at each stage you find some prior physical circumstance, uh, neural arrangements in your brain and so on, that, that determined what was going to happen next. And you might say, no, but that's all wrong. Quantum mechanics has shown us... Well, it's partly right, but it's not all the truth, right? I mean, the, the truth... I mean, if, you, if you're a materialist, doesn't... Material, sorry, uh, listeners. Materialism is the view that the the mind is the same as the brain. I think that's a sort of good summary of it. But if you say that, aren't you denying the power of free choice to human beings? Sorry, I I, I, I want to know where where we are now. So you asked me about why I thought that quantum mechanics how it mattered to sure. the mind brain debate, and I was explaining that. But uh -huh. do you want to switch to free will now, or should we should we stick no, with quantum mechanics? No, carry on if you want with the quantum mechanics. You know. Okay, you sure? Okay, let's 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 do that. So I was 
explaining why the fact that quantum mechanics shows us that the physical world is not in fact deterministic doesn't make any difference to mm -hmm. the earlier reason for thinking right. there can't be a separate mind. And the reason is this. I mean, you, you might think, well, so quantum mechanics is indeterministic. It's, it's, it says that we've got certain physical arrangements. And then it's a chancy matter, say, whether some molecule will, will split in the brain. And that, that makes room for a separate mind to mm, come well, in. Well, that's and not what I think. I think, I think quantum mechanics makes so, so room I, I, for choice I was, in I was, I was being rhetorical when I said uh, you might think. I meant uh, one might think. Okay. All right. Uh, and... Uh, and certainly, certainly many people do think this, and they think that's, that's indeed how there's room for an independent mind, perhaps with some kind of spontaneous uh, ability to decide to make a difference to the physical world, consistently with quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. But whether or not well, that's what you think, that's, that's what many people, right. people think, and I think it's a mistake. Oh, I agree because, with that, yeah. I would think that's the wrong way of thinking. Uh, Right, so we, we don't need to go into why we, it's a wrong oh, way I don't thinking. think we dis disagree on, bit, on that implication of that idea of quantum mechanics. But I, th but I, think many I think many people do think that quantum mechanics allows room for an independent, spontaneous mind to make a difference in just the way I said. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not you. So perhaps it's worth explaining why that's a bad way to think. Okay, why do you think it's a bad way to think? Uh, because while quantum mechanics doesn't say that prior physical circumstances determine what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. next. It, does, it does say that prior physical circumstances fix the probability mm -hmm. of what's going to happen next. Sure. So if you look at quantum mechanics, it will say in these physical circumstances, there's a 60% a probability that this molecule mm -hmm. will split in a yeah. certain way. And so that fact in itself means there's no room for an independent mind to make a difference in the physical world. I mean, if you thought it did, well, then presumably you, you, you think that given those prior physical circumstances, in cases where somebody tries to move their arm, the molecule will split more mm -hmm. than the 60%. And, I mean, that's, that's a perfectly coherent view, mm -hmm. that kind of view that the mind comes down and makes it. But if, if it were true, you ought to go and tell your friends in the physics department, they would, would win a Nobel Prize straight away. Uh -huh. I mean, it's inconsistent with quantum mechanics to suppose that something other than the prior physical circumstances can affect the probability of what happens next in the brain. And that's mm -hmm. why you really don't have any choice except to identify your choices, your, your choosings, your feelings with the prior physical circumstances in the brain in order to get them to affect mm -hmm. the movements of your bodies, which of course they do. I don't follow the dichotomy. I mean, just because it doesn't work that one way that you've just... Um that you've just described doesn't mean it's going to work, not going to work another way. I mean, this goes back to my tr um, question just before. I mean, mm. doesn't, doesn't the idea that um, the mind has no effect on the physical brain, uh, or however you would phrase it, doesn't mm -hmm. that mean that there is no such thing as choice? No, but I, d I, th I think the mind has all kinds of effects on the physical brain. But I then if, if it does, then surely the mind is a separate thing from the brain. I don't quite see why that... Well, that if it's the same as the brain, how can the... It's like you're saying that the brain has effects on itself, but... Well, of course it does. Don't you think the brain has effects on yes, itself? Yes, I do, but I think the mind is an entirely different thing from the brain. Right, but that's what I disagree about, you see. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think that the mind doesn't make a difference to the brain and what I do and achieve. Of course it does. Okay. But it does so by being part of the brain. If you think it's not part of the brain, then it's very hard to see how it makes a difference to what I think and do and but, achieve. Uh, can you uh, flesh out what you mean a bit by saying the mind is part of the brain? I mean, obviously, I would say that the mind is produced by the brain, but I would say that the mind isn't the same thing as the brain, just because they don't have the same sorts of properties. I mean, obviously, the brain well, has physical properties, like it occupies space, it's, it's it has physical causation, whereas the mind doesn't occupy, you know, uh, things like experiences I th I th I don't occupy space. And uh, otherwise I'm, I'm we'd see them when we look inside the brain, for instance. Well, I think my experiences are inside my brain and your experiences inside your brain. Where else would they no, be? No, I wouldn't deny that. I, right, I well, think so, so, so they, are, they are in space, I mean, and they're in time. My no, my no, I was, uh, perhaps I was being too lenient then in that mm. case. I think... I think experiences exist in mental space and, and physical things exist in physical space. But there is a, they, the, the mind is connected to the physical world through the brain. Um, maybe we should talk about something 
else? Because I, th- I think we're moving away from the arguments here and just, just sure. stating what we think. And I mean, uh, you asked me, I mean, how do I think the, the mind is part of the brain? Mm-hmm. I think the brain is a complex, very complex organization, as we were discussing earlier, 50 billion neurons, each, each with a thousand connections. And a lot of very complicated processes go on in the brain. And some of those are mental processes. Sure. Some of them are what it is for me to have feelings, make decisions, not, and act. I'm not really sort of so clear on what it means to say it's part of the brain rather than saying, for instance, that the mind is connected to the brain Well, as how, a different how, thing how, from how, the brain. How do you get on with the idea that uh, Yorkshire is part of England? Do you have trouble with that? No. Okay, well, it's like that. Okay, you, you, but, might, you mightn't believe it, but you said you didn't understand but it. Then, I mean, uh, I guess my, my problem is that the, the mind has completely different properties to the brain, to me. I mean, it's like, your ex- okay, let me put it another way. Your experience of looking at the yellow of this wall, right? Yeah. If, first of all, you open your brain up, you wouldn't be able to see an experience of the yellow. The only thing that can see the experience is the mind. So... In that sense, what you see inside the, mu- the brain isn't equivalent to the mind. But I'm afraid that's, that's, one not, way that's, to that's, not, that's not a very strong argument. So, mm-hmm. so, so my view is that here I am seeing the yellow of the wall, okay, and that's a matter of certain light rays coming into my eyes, causing certain activities sure. in V1, the visual cortex going up to V4. Uh, I categorize the surface in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And when that goes on, this is what it's like. For yeah. somebody whose uh, brain is like that, it's like this. I don't know what you'd expect it to be like for somebody whose brain is like that, but this is what it's like. Yeah, but that, right, could be, mm-hmm. Let me finish. Mm-hmm. If you can open my brain right. and look into my brain, mm-hmm. you aren't somebody who is looking at a yellow wall having yellow light waves coming into your eye. You're somebody who's looking at a brain right. having grey light waves coming into your eye. So that's why it's different when you look at my brain than it is for me when I look at the wall. So you've just, you've just proved what I've just been saying all along. You've just said it's different. You've, you've, you've spent the last okay. ha- half an hour saying they're the same thing, and now you've just said they're different. What I've just said, Grant, if you concentrate for a minute, I've said that mm-hmm. looking at a brain is different from looking at a yellow wall. I don't think anybody um, could dispute that. Well, no, what you've actually said is looking at your brain is different from seeing with your mind the yellow wall, right? Well, of, I course, mean, it, of course it is. So, which, therefore, which, they're different things, right? You're trying to show that... My seeing a yellow wall right. is different from my brain doing certain things, right? And um, you, you, I mean, that's, that's something it's you It's a result you, of your brain doing certain things. Good, good. You're trying to say that they're... Yeah, it's, it's different because it's a result. A result of something is different from the thing itself. You're trying to say there's two things there. Yeah. You cannot establish that by showing me that looking at a brain is different from looking at a yellow wall. It's, they're clearly different, but, that, but it's not the issue. Uh-huh. Uh, you can show that... You're trying to show that A is not equal to B, right? right? And you show me that C is not equal to B. It's not establishing the point. Looking at my brain, I mean, I think that what goes on in you when you look at, look at my brain mm-hmm. is different from what goes on in you when you look at the yellow wall. What could be more no, obvious? That's, that's true, but that's not the point, is it? The point is that I can't see any of the activity of your mind when I look into your brain. No, that's because you're not me. Yeah, exactly. That's the point that I'm making, though, isn't it? There's a, there's, a sepa- there's a separate thing that is you, that is the mind that is doing the experience, that is different from the brain that in you or- look in, at. In, in order to have my experience, you have to have my brain doing the things it's doing. You're obviously not going to have the experience, even from my point of view, by looking at my brain. Yeah. Looking at my brain does not but give why, you my brain. Why don't I see your experiences when I look at your brain? Because you're not having them, you're looking at my brain. Yeah, exactly. So I think we, we're sort of we're destined to disagree on this point. Let's move on uh, to I, something. I, f- I fear we are. Yeah. OK, uh, I think maybe we'll probably just go straight into another song now and uh, then we'll move on to something else. Um, OK, this song is called Man in the Corner. It's Ross and Ella's song, okay. called Man in the Corner.
about The music plays to no unknown faces Smiles and laughter, the general chatter The TV screen shows a catching advert There in a corner Sitting at his voice A man of a time that's not gone by And all the smile on his face Oh, on his face On his face Everybody's talking, someone is walking The girl at the bar is serving with a smile The clock is ticking, love is kissing and bickering And then there's that man in the corner Rosanella and Alan. Um, if you like their music, they often do the Fab, which is the Folk Americana and Blues Club at Royston, the Royston Pub in Lily Road on a Ralston, Saturday. R Y L S T O N. Oh, sorry, at the Ralston Pub. Okay, yeah. and uh, <laughs> Lily Road. Lily All right, I think they got that now. Um, I'm Grant Bartley from Philosophy Now magazine. You're listening to the Philosophy Now radio show. Um, I'm talking to Professor David Papanu, who's uh, the Professor of Philosophy of Natural Science at um, King's College London. And uh, as well as your interest in the philosophy of mind, David, you're also interested in the philosophy of science. Now, uh, one of the things you're interested in, I understand, is, is what they call scientific realism, which is the question, does science get at the truth? I mean... How would you start to answer that question? Or what is it about that question that really interests you? What interests me most is what most other philosophers of science say about it, because okay. it's rather surprising. I mean, I think that, well, there's cases and cases, and I don't think it makes much sense to say science in general gets at the truth. There's right. good bits of science and bad bits of science. Mm -hmm. but, but I certainly think that, that science can get at the truth, and quite often it does. But this is a surprisingly minority view among philosophers of science. Uh, I mean, we started by introducing me as a philosopher, professor of, the professor of philosophy of natural right. science. Quite a mouthful. And there's, as I said, there's a story that comes with that. When I was appointed to this job at King's uh, uh, 20 years ago, there was a small history and philosophy of science department, and they were getting a new professor, mm -hmm. and they were very, very keen that it be a professor of natural science right. because they didn't want some professor of social science or human science or mm -hmm. sociologist mm -hmm. or some kind of relativist and, and they were all good hard-headed paparians sorry As, that, me that means that they believe that uh, science proceeds by a, a falsification of exactly. uh, previous existing theories in other words you don't prove a, a theory is true you you prove a given idea is is dis is not true by falsifying it or f finding evidence against it just what I was going to say. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the surprising thing about the Popperians is that they don't think science gets at the truth. Okay. As, as Grant just explained, they think the characteristic fate of all scientific theories 
is to be shown to be false. And if you took their view seriously, which most of them kind of weren't always clear-headed enough to do, the implication would be that you should never believe the predictions of science. You should never believe that a bridge made a certain way is more likely to hold up than a bridge made another way. And uh, you should just trust to luck when it comes to expecting things in the future. Uh, and it's a pretty absurd view. Okay. Uh, so... But I don't want to go on about that. I mean, this, this is just sure. uh, uh, bad-mouthing my uh, professional colleagues. But a surprising number of them don't think that science gets at the truth. And I think okay. this is a very odd view, not least because this kind of blanket scepticism about scientific theories, that they're all mistaken, they're all going to turn out to be wrong, stops the philosophers of science from doing what I think is the most important thing in this area, is to try and distinguish the good science from the bad. I mean, somebody tells you that uh, there's global warming, that uh, uh, AIDS isn't caused by a virus, that uh, mad cow disease is caused by prions, that uh, we want to know, are these serious theories that are backed by a lot of evidence, mm -hmm. or are they just speculations that quite likely are going to turn out to be false? I think there's a difference. I think in science, quite often, some theories really do get firmly established by huge amounts of evidence. Okay. And other theories are just speculations often promulgated by the men in white coats because they have some uh, agenda to, to push, and we really want to be able to tell the difference. So just going around saying science never gets at the truth seems yeah. to me to be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. I mean, I suppose we could back up a bit and say uh, what... Would it mean to say that science gets, gets at the truth? I mean, what is the truth in scientific terms? Is it a, a description of reality that is valid or...? Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any deep issues here. I mean, there's various technical issues, right. but, I mean, I say it's raining outside, and yeah. uh, that's true if, in fact, it's raining outside. Uh, the scientists say that uh, matter is made of tiny little atoms too small to see one kind for each element. That's true if matter is indeed made of tiny little atoms too okay, small to see so one kind for each element. I, mean, I, I, I think it's just a straightforward matter. I mean, uh, <coughs> what it is for scientific theories to be true is pretty straightforward. How we can tell which ones are true, that's a very much more complicated yeah. business. I mean, that's not straightforward at all. And that's and, what you're interested in, how you know the, good, the, the true ones from the false ones. Yeah, but again, I don't think, I mean, despite the philosophers of science, I don't think there's anything at first pass very deep and difficult here. Mm -hmm. Some theories have lots and lots of evidence to support them. Other theories okay. are just speculations. And if you talk to the best scientists, they will make just this kind of, of distinction. I can remember going to a talk by, by, by Martin Rees, the... the Astronomer Royal, where he was talking about various issues in cosmology. Right. And he said the Big Bang hypothesis, he would bet £1,000 to a penny. I mean, there's huge amounts of evidence. I mean, the redshift, the uh, background radiation and so on. It's hard to see how all that could be so unless there was a Big Bang starting off the universe. But he said there's a very popular view among many cosmologists, which is supposed to explain the, the low entropy state early in the universe, and it's to do with there was a sudden inflation uh, after three seconds or something. And he said that's an interesting idea, but there's not much evidence, and I think it's about 50-50. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we need to know. So, again, as, I mean, you might... You might worry a bit about what makes something evidence for a theory but basically the theory predicts things that would be amazing if the theory weren't true well yeah. then that's good reason to believe the theory huh? so um am i correct in thinking that you mm. one of the things that you think tells mm. a good scientific theory is that it's mm. able to predict things that you would not otherwise know unless you have the theory i think that's that's the right way to think about Evidence. What what supports a view? What what should make you attach more cred credence to it? Make make believe it more firmly? Is that it predicts surprising things that turn out to be turn out to be true? I mean, oh. I mean that's that's. I mean, re remember 
I mean, the classic case is is general relativity that mm-hmm. made Einstein so yeah, very sure. famous in 1919, and he predicted that light would bend when it went past the sun. I mean, nobody had ever thought of such a thing, completely weird thing. And lo and behold, it does. I mean, you sure. might have thought beforehand that's an interesting theory, but pretty weird. But once you, once you see that, you think, ooh, that must be right. Okay, is there any other um, particular areas you think are good for showing a scientific theory is true apart from you know obviously if you observe like Hmm? a million white swans you've got a good idea to think that all swans are white right no i don't know that i mean it depends what alternative theories are and what they Uh what they predict uh i uh one thing that that philosophers of science often say is look you you shouldn't really be so confident of these these uh scientific theories that you think are firmly established because when we look at the history of science Mm -hmm. lots of theories that people took to be firmly established turned out to be wrong uh, newton's theory uh um, autonomy's uh, theory uh mm -hmm. uh, and i mean uh, phlogiston theory miasma theory of disease but the truth is that when you look at the theories that turn out to be wrong there seems to be a pattern that either they don't have very much evidence for them, or, I mean, Mm -hmm. Newton's theory had a lot of evidence, but it was a very bold theory about the whole structure of space and time, and the evidence was limited to a fairly restricted area Uh of space and time. So so what you find is, is the theories that turn out to be false tend to be the ones where their ambitions far outshoot the evidence for them. I mean, here's here's another example. I mean, take theories about the recent origin of human beings i mean what what happened in between us splitting off from from the the chimpanzees and now and Uh you know people it's just a stratopithecus and then and then they change their mind and and those theories keep on and why it's because they've got scarcely any evidence they're going on a few bits of teeth and bone and they construct a theory on that Uh and it's very easy to find some more evidence that shows that's wrong okay so would, but, but would other, a, other bits of science do have overwhelming amounts of evidence so would so a fair sort of principle be that uh, a scientific theory is probably true in proportion to the amount of favorable evidence favorable evidence of different kinds and in particular evidence that wouldn't be true if the alternative theories were right Mm-hmm. But so, doesn't doesn't that also leave the falsificationist point of view open to say, uh, but there could always be things that show it to be wrong? And isn't that what the people who say uh, science is always progressing and, you know, there might be a model of the universe that is better than Einstein's, for instance? Uh, I think it's a terrible fallacy. Uh-huh. And I think it's, it's, it's a problem that fouled up all the Popperians to make the move from... It's possible that this theory is wrong. Right. It, it, it could be wrong. We could find evidence to you oughtn't to believe it. And that's it. Yeah. Look, I, in this area, we're trying to go from a certain amount of evidence to something that goes beyond the evidence. And by the nature of the case, it's logically possible that even though the evidence is so, the theory we're extrapolating from it is going to turn out to be mistaken. But mm-hmm. a mere possibility is not a probability, let alone a high probability. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possible that my... I mean, it's consistent with what I know. I can't disprove it conclusively that my wife has just run off with a guitar player from Milton Keynes. It's possible. But should I now think, well, I don't believe that she's waiting for me in a restaurant in King's Cross? I mean, of course I believe that. I so the moral, think I, I, I'd, I'd bet a thousand pounds. So the moral of the story is yeah. to, that you should believe what you've got good, you know, good reasons to believe, yeah. and and why why follow something that you don't have good reasons to believe. I'm afraid that's a very boring. Uh, no, I agree. But, I mean, but, this is an area but, we agree in, so yes. that's good. We've finally yes. reached an area of agreement. Good. good. Uh-huh. Um, also, some things that you're interested in, in is meaning and representation. What, what interests you about meaning and representation? Well, so I started off talking about the materialist view of the mind, right. and uh, right, let's, let's not go there uh, <laughs> in these last five minutes, but it's the same issue. How do we fit these things that you might have thought 
uh, involve more than just the material facts and material structures in, in mm-hmm. the world into a material world. So, so the challenge, just as with the conscious mind, is to explain how, how representation is possible right. in a material world. How, how is it that a purely physical system, uh, within such a system, you, c- you can get something standing for something else? I mean, that's the yeah. problem of representation. How can, how can one thing... That's that what we- consciousness is, is it? Is that what you're saying? Consciousness is something standing for something else? Is that what you're I saying? I guess... Con- n- look... Representation is, look, the word Lima stands for a city on the other side of the globe. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing standing for something else. Uh, uh, A sentence that it's raining in Lima is representing things to be thus and so. How can one thing represent something else? Now, so that's the problem of representation, problem of meaning, and then there's the problem of consciousness. And it's not to be taken for granted that they're the same problem or even have very much to do with each other. Some people think mm-hmm. that some people want to explain consciousness in terms of representation. Some people want to explain representation in terms of consciousness. But at first pass, I think we should just ap- approach the two problems separately. Right. I mean, after all, it does look as if uh, we can have representation without consciousness. I mean, I, I just talked about words representing. Right. Words aren't conscious. Well, you might say they only represent because a conscious being. Yeah. Rep- but you might think of a computer uh, as representing things. You might think that that computer is representing the sounds that I'm making right right now. You might think that rather simple animals represent things to be thus and so. When a I don't know, a mouse uh, sees uh, something flashing across the sky and scurries under a bush, it might well be representing that there's an owl there. And it might be representing wrongly. I mean, the thing that, uh-huh. that caught its attention might be, a, might be an aeroplane or a helicopter okay, or something. Okay, so what, so, what hmm? problems in the philosophy of representation really intrigue you? And how do you answer them? What problems? Uh, what well, how, how, how to explain? Well, it, what kind of material system do you need uh-huh. in order for it to be true that some feature of it represents something else mm-hmm. and people have many different different views about okay about what, this. what's your view my view is that it's to do with biological design it's it's a product of evolution evolution mm-hmm. in, evolves rather complicated uh uh, organisms that can uh, adapt themselves to the environment in all kinds of ways, and in one way it uh, does this is it creates animals who can form states, brain states. I mean, don't let's worry about the consciousness of brain states that will direct them to act in certain ways, right. where those ways of acting are a good idea if circumstances are thus and so. So, a little mouse, right? It's got a brain right. state, makes it run under the bush. And this is a good thing to do if there's an owl overhead. And I say that's a natural basis for saying that this brain state in the mouse is representing there to be an owl. And I think the right way to understand representation is to start with those kind of cases and then build up to more and more complicated uh, evolved cognitive systems. And when we understand them and understand what they've been designed to do in biological terms, we'll be able to see that the different bits represent different features of the environment. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, of course you can. Um, with regards to this one, in fact, um, mm. about representation, mm. and that example you, you brought about of Lima, yeah. which is a town, yeah. Yeah. but that same word yeah. can mean something else in a different language. So yeah. we have representation mm. and perception um, in different, according to... Um, a different person, different individual, different yeah. brain, yeah. according to his or her experience. So yeah. how can we associate that to biology only? Couldn't you so that experience that comes into it as well? I think so. So, I, so I, I, I mean, of course it's not the physical nature of the word that makes it represent what it does. I mean, the same physical word might represent the capital of Peru in one language and a certain kind of bean. I mean, is, is a lima bean from Lima, Peru, anyway? No, it's in Italian. Lima is actually um, a filing 
by filing to, to file your the, the little very thing good you exactly so, so so it's not it's not the physical nature of the word but it's something to do with what th- how the word is used by people yeah. what it leads people to do it's and the so thought on we create with it's that. the yeah. meaning of the word or the connotations perhaps yes but uh, I still think if, if you can analyze how it fits into a more complicated system that enables uh-huh. the the user of the word to interact with the environment in a certain way then you can understand what makes it the case that the word stands for something in the environment for those people, for those people. Mm. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're coming to the end of the show now, so we're just going to... Uh, I'm just going to say, you've been listening to the Philosophy Now radio show. I've been with uh, uh, Professor David Papen, and we've been talking about uh, mind and science and stuff, mm. and, and, and bye. <laughs>